referring, if you'll remember in the last session, we had quite the spaghetti bowl of arrows going back and forth as to who all the different financial advisors are, the people that call themselves financial advisors, what their compensation is, how they might advise you, and what kind of advice you should expect to get. In reality, all you want as the investor, as the family person, as the employee, whatever it is, is to get good advice and, and, and to get good help and to understand the idea of here's, here's my income, my expenses, I want to be able to save for my future, I want to be able to protect myself, How do I make all these work together for my financial life? And, and in reality, there's no right way to do this. There's not necessarily a best way to do this. There are some really awful ways to do it. Um, but the problem is all the people that would give you advice are compensated in different ways. Um, that's not to say they're bad people, that's not to say they're wrong, that there's nothing that, that says that everyone who gives you advice that is suitable for you is necessarily doing the wrong thing, nor everyone that charges you an AUM fee is doing the wrong thing. They're probably looking out for your best interest, they're probably very good people, it just might be some of their bias, some, somewhat based on their compensation, some based on what they've learned and what they've been taught and where they came from, and it might be biased based somewhat on their upbringing and their situation and what they've seen. I know I can give different people advice and a lot of times I'll say, look, I'm biased towards or against these certain products or these certain investments because of direct experience that I or my family might have had. And I just say, listen, here's a bad experience I had. That doesn't mean it's wrong for you, but it, it honestly makes me biased against or, or for certain products just because of my personal experience. Again, there's no way to, to say this is exactly the best thing or the best advice for anyone because we'll never know what the best advice was until 5, 10, 20 years down the road when we get to look back and see what actually happened because none of us knows what's going to happen in the markets or with interest rates or with the government or with your job or with your home property values, there are all these things we can't control. And what we try to do is put the best plans in place, knowing that we can't control a lot of those factors, to give you the best chance to succeed in your financial life so that this doesn't become too much of a source of stress and anxiety. You can go about the, the rest of your life and this is somewhat taken care of. You have an idea of it. And the problem is when you don't take care of this or you don't trust or you don't have an advisor or some way to, to manage this, you either manage it yourself, which adds more stress to it, or you don't do anything, which is even worse, which means either all your money goes into the bank or all your money goes into some sort of crazy investment or some really good investments or you're not diversified. Maybe you've done really well in real estate for the last 10 years and that bubble or that market explodes and then you, you, you're left without any money. That's what happened to a lot of people in 2008 and 2009. They were doing so well in real estate that when the real estate market came crashing down, they all of a sudden had no money. It was not liquid. They couldn't sell. They couldn't pay their bills. So that's what we really don't want to happen. That's what all of us as financial advisors do not want to happen. So in the last several years, with, with the younger and younger generation of people working, a lot of people have gone online and gotten a lot of advice, and that's part of the problem is those of us who are advisors who give advice for a living are competing with articles and blogs and their advisors. We're also competing with what's called, with what's been called robo-advisors. Right. And robo-advisors, Betterment is one, and I'm not endorsing anyone. Wealthfront is one, uh, personal capital. 
they'll say, look, we're just going to use algorithms. We're going to figure out when you invest your money with us, we're going to use some sort of algorithms to, to manage it. And so instead of you're paying 1% that you might pay to an advisor to us, you might pay 0.5%. Because we're not going to use as many people, we're going to use more computers. And we're going to decide your allocation based on age, risk profile, needs, etc. And so we might put you in the portfolio that says you're in 75% equity, 25% uh, fixed, which is to say it's, it's debt, it, it's uh, loans, it's, it's credit, things like that. We might put you in this, and our computers, as this, as let's say the stock market goes up, and this goes to 80, 20, the computers are going to rebalance this to put it back to 75, 25. And since it's computers and algorithms that are doing this, we don't have to pay a person to do it, and therefore we can lower our fees. And they've gotten billions and billions and billions of dollars under management, and they charge a much lower fee, and they don't have a lot of people. They well, not say they don't have. They don't have as many people. Um, the good part is they've gotten a lot of, of the younger people who previously didn't work with advisors because advisors generally have a minimum, right? They have a two hundred fifty thousand dollar minimum or a five hundred thousand dollar minimum to work with them. Because if you're charging one percent, and someone comes in with, I, I have fifty thousand dollars for you to manage. You're not going to make a whole lot of money on it. You're going to make 500 bucks a year. Well, how much time? How much of my time are you going to get for 500 dollars a year? I'm not going to be able to to spend the time to give you a huge financial plan, right? So the great part about robo advisors is they've gotten so many more people into uh, start investing and saving for their future and doing it in a, in a really good way. The other cool thing that we've seen from robo advisors. Um, is they have uh, a lot of goals-based planning, okay? With, which might say, look, in addition to my retirement, which is this kind of nebulous goal, right? If I'm in my 20s or 30s and even 40s, retirement is way out in my 70s. It's really hard to see my behavior change and how that affects my retirement. But what they might say is, you want to save for a down payment And that might be, you know, a hundred thousand dollar down payment, right? And you might have twenty five thousand to start with, and and it helps you figure out how much do I need to put in every month, and then how is this going to be managed, and I can track my progress of this getting to that, okay? And it's goals based, and it's great because what this helps me do is change my behavior. And that's what we've gotten to. If you, if you go back to the last video when I was talking about the big change in retirement planning when we went from pension to 401k, the biggest problem there was investor behavior. And what happened there is employees said, I want to invest in my own 401k, and employers said, okay. So employees, you know, immediately they started investing in their own 401k, and then what happened was when they have the option, they go, well, maybe I won't do it this year because this year I want to buy a car. I'll do it next year. And then next year became the next year and the next year and the next year. And, and finally what they find out is they're 50 years old and they've saved nothing for retirement because they keep putting it off. Or since they get to manage their own investments, they buy at the wrong time and sell at the wrong time because they think they really know what's happening in the market and they end up completely underperforming the market or not having any growth at all. What we've gotten really bad about is our behavior in terms of our finances. We need help. This kind of planning helps with the behavior. And the behavior is, I can see this ticking up to get to that. And I know when I get this, I get a house. Okay? I now have money for a house when I get to here, and I get to see that goal, and I get to put in the behaviors and say, if I put in $500 or $1,000 a month, I can see how long it's going to take to get to that number. 
it, it changes my behavior. That's important. What we've also seen is the rise in algorithmic trading. Algorithmic trading really means that computers, that people are going to develop computer models that are going to evaluate all the stocks, bonds, equities, funds, ETFs, everything else, and trade it regularly based on certain patterns and certain recognition and certain market conditions and everything else that they've seen in the past, and they want to translate that to what they think will happen in the future. Um, algorithms, the nice thing is once you've spent a lot of money to build them, they don't cost a lot of money to run, and they, they tend to actually perform pretty well. And, and once they're running, you can just set them to run. So I can invest my money in some sort of algorithmic uh, program, and it'll manage this 75, 25, 40. And it might be 75, within this 75, 50% is US and the rest of it is international. And it might be, be getting that to, to that level of granularity. What a lot of these robo advisors also have is the ability for advisors like me to piggyback on top of their services, right? Because I can I can be an advisor that uses Betterment or Wealth Fund or Personal Capital, and I might say, I'm going to give the advice to my clients, and I want to change their behavior, so we're going to talk about how much they're putting towards retirement, and we're going to use this robo-advisor to manage that, and we're going to use the robo to manage these goals. It's actually really cool, and they're getting so much money put into them because they're bringing down a lot of the fees involved in the actual investment management, and they're able to put some of that back on me as the advisor to do my job and to help you figure out how much do I need to put into my savings, and how much do I need to put into my home, how much do I need to put into my retirement, because that should be my job. So this is actually showing us a bit of the future, and whereas advisors in in the last several years have been very much against the robo-advisors because we feel like they're taking our job. The job they're taking is the asset management job, the investment management job. The job that they're not taking right now is the advice job, okay? But they're trying, and here's the part of the advice job that they're trying to take, okay? I have clients that come to me. Let's say I have a, a client that's retired and needs to and, and needs some money and they need to figure out where do I pull my money from, right? Because I might have my bank account, I might have my uh, investment account, I might have my individual retirement account, right? These all have different tax ramifications and they come to me and they say, I need fifty thousand dollars, where do I get it from? And my job is to say, well, if you take the $50,000 from here, it gets taxed as income. If you take it from here, it gets taxed as capital gains. If you take it from here, there's no tax, okay? But then you don't have any liquid money anymore. So maybe we figure out where to, to take all this money from. Now, you can build a program that does that. It's really not that difficult to do. You can build a program that says, where's the most tax efficient way to, to get my money this year? And it's going to look at all the different tax rates and what it means for you, in particular, your tax basis and what you've already taken this year and what you're going to need for the, the rest of the year and what the current tax rates are and everything else. And it'll say you take 20 from here, 20 from here, and 10 from here, and you spit out the answer. There's going to be a time in the very near future where my clients don't need me to help make this decision. So that's going to be outsourced to software. So then the question is, where do I fit? Right? Where do I as the advisor fit? Where is the advisor of the future going to fit? And how are we going to get compensated? And that's where we have, I don't know, what, what I call probably the FinTech stack. Right? You've heard of uh, tech stacks and program. This is the FinTech stack. And at the bottom here is where we're going to have investment management, right? And this is where you have your AI, your robo uh, advisors, your algorithmic trading. 
and some sort of programs that can manage your investments. And they're gonna manage them to you know, something that, that might be like a 60, 40 split, 60% equity, 40% uh, fixed income. They might manage different sectors. They might manage for growth, whatever it might be. But they might be managing the investments. Now, I'm not saying all investment management is going to be outsourced to here because you still need people looking at some of the companies and the equities and you still need some people managing some of the funds. Um, you still have some of that, but a lot of it, a lot of it for most people is going to be outsourced to uh, algorithms and uh, investment robos and things like that. On top of that, you have other fintech tools. Okay, this is going to be tools like budgeting tools. This is going to be risk-based tools. Okay, that evaluate my risk. And at any point, this is going to be tools like tax tools. Like the example I just did, how much, where should I take my money from, or where should I put my money into? They, they might be mortgage tools, or buy versus sell tools. It might also be um, reporting. I might help my client choose which of the robo advisors, Betterment, Wealthfront, Personal Capital, any of those to choose from. You might have something like Acorns, or Mint or Robinhood, right, that are going to um, help people with some of their behaviors. Behaviors are going to be a big deal going forward. You might have tools that help with credit, right? How do I raise my credit score? How do I lower the amount of, of debt I have? There are all sorts of these tools. There's uh, what we call as financial planning tools, right? Financial planning tools take into account your income, your expenses, your assets, and everything else, and we can model different scenarios. So I might use, there might be financial planning tools, right? Now these might charge, they, they might charge somewhat of an AUM fee, but they might just charge a, a regular subscription. I don't know, I don't know how these are going to charge in the future. I'm guessing it'll most likely be some sort of AUM, but it's gonna be so much lower than we have now, because in essence, these are just computers doing the work. So instead of being 1%, it might be 0.1%, right? These all might have different prices in them, right? There might be a, you know, you might pay monthly, you might pay one time for this, you might pay monthly for that, you pay monthly for this, you pay one time for this mortgage tool, uh, Acorns and Mint and such, you, you might pay monthly for some of those, this might be bundled, I don't know. But you're gonna pay some, some, some sort of either subscription or a one-time fee for these tools. And these tools are going to help you and help your advisor figure these things out. And then you have the financial planning. This is where we get into me as the advisor getting to know you as the client. I want to know, you know, obviously what things like your salary and your work and your, and your goals are. But I also need to know things, I, I, I need to know your goals, right? And we need to talk about them. Because a lot of people just say, well, I want to retire with X amount, and I want to travel and everything else. But what we really need to get down to is what are your goals? What do you feel are the values you want to pass maybe to your family or to have? And you say, man, I would really like to travel the world. Well, that, that's a goal, but we need to turn that goal into some sort of financial behavior, right? That gets me to this, we need to help you your behaviors. How are we going to stack some of these tools so that you can see the growth towards your goals? We need to help you with that. We're going to help you with with financial, uh, I have some clients who call it therapy. They just need to talk to me sometimes about, hey, what's, I need to tell you what's going on with the money in my business. Here's what I'm worried about with regard to my investments. Here's what I'm worried about with regard to some of my goals. Am I even going to get there? Uh, I'm worried that the market's going down and I'm not going to make as much money. I'm worried my business isn't going to make as much money. What should I do? And we need to talk about it. And I need to be prepared to talk about a lot of these things with my clients. These tools are going to help me be armed with better knowledge and be able to, to make better 
numbers decisions. These tools are just going to manage the investments up and down, right? I'm there for financial therapy. Um, I might be there to help them with, with some, you know, family uh, education. Right? I might there be there to help them with legacy planning. What do I want to leave behind? What do I have to leave behind? Right? We need to talk about legacy. We need to talk about getting wills done and that sort of uh, estate planning done, whether they have a large estate or not, because we need to talk through, look, here's what really happens. We might have a tool here, like a, a legacy or estate planning tool, where you plug in all your data and it just kicks out, look, when you die at this age, here's how much you'll be leaving behind. When you die at a different, if you die at a different age, here's how much you'll be leaving behind and to whom. You might have a tool, but we want to talk about what does that mean for you? What does that mean for your family? Are you prepared for that? Are they prepared for it? Is that going to take care of uh, everything? You might have, I might have clients, we might have clients that, that change jobs, right? So we'll talk about job change. What that, what difference does that make? We'll talk about allocation, right? We might have a tool that helps us figure out what the best allocation is among savings, uh, retirement plan, home, and all that. But we need to talk about what that means for you. Are you comfortable with that? Does it fit your risk? We're going to talk about what risk means because you can fill out all sorts of uh, tools and, and use all sorts of tools to ask you questions to try to determine your risk. But I would say a your risk is, your, is the measure of your stomach and not your head. What can you live with? You might say, well, I'm 25 years old. I'm really risky. I want all my uh, investments to be in super growth technology stocks. Uh, I think they're all going to shoot through the, the roof. But then when you get your 401k statement and it's dropped 10% in the last month because the NASDAQ dropped, are you not able to sleep at night? You have stomach aches, are you going to call and yell at me? If that's the case, that's not your risk. We need to talk about what risk really means. It doesn't mean I'm young and so I want everything to grow. It means what can I live with? What am I comfortable with? And does my risk match my goals and my behaviors? Okay. This is the goal of the financial plan, to look at, to use these tools, to find these investments, and make sure that this all fits in with what you as a person wants. This, I feel, is going to, should best be done on a subscription basis. And the reason is, because if this is done on a subscription basis, and I as the planner don't care really if the money goes into insurance or investments or into these robos or into the bank, if I don't care about that from a compensation standpoint, then I can give you the best advice. Now, this subscription might be different subscription levels based on your level of wealth because generally higher levels of wealth or higher levels of income mean I need to use more of these tools. And I'm probably going to have to talk to you a lot more. If you don't have as much money to allocate, there's not that much that we really need to talk about, but I can still be there along the way for questions about jobs, for questions about homes, right? For questions about cars, about college savings. I'm there to answer those questions. I'm there to explain what some of these are. I'm there to explain how these work. Mostly I'm there to look at goals, behavior, um, answer questions about legacy, allocation. I'm there to talk to you and be your advisor. And it shouldn't matter from a compensation standpoint what we invest in, as long as it's the right thing and the best thing for you and for your situation. That is what I think the financial planner or the financial advisor of the future looks like. The financial advisor of the future is someone who is, who, who is versed in this level of technology, but is able to take that along with the trust They built that, that, that they built up that their clients have in them, and along with the ability to have relationships with clients, and be able to use these tools and these tools and help the clients with all these parts of their financial life and, and make their the life they want match the finances they have as best they can. That is the financial advisor of the future.